In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all ages, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one essence with the Father, through him all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit, and the Virgin Mary, and became human, and was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate, and suffered and was buried, and rose on the third day according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. And in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who together with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, and who spoke through the prophets. In one holy, Catholic and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I expect the resurrection of the dead and life of the age to come. Amen. Christos Aneste. Hope you're all well, um, and my apologies, my apologies for last week as well, having to cancel. I haven't been the best this past week. I like doing much better than what I was last week. This week, I wanted to re reflect a little bit more and speak about uh, the gospel that we read on Sunday. Uh, there's a lot of uh, meaning in the gospel which we read. For those of you who were at church on Sunday, it was the Sunday of the Samaritan woman, known as the Samaritan woman, which is, also, which is always the fourth Sunday after Pascha, next Sunday being the Sunday of the blind man, and then, or well, this Sunday coming is the Sunday of the blind man, and then on Wednesday, we have what we call the Apodosis, or the leave-taking of Pascha, the 40 days after Pascha, uh, where we close the feast. And Thursday, next Thursday, will be the Ascension of Christ. Um, and I did speak a little bit about the Gospel reading on Sunday about the Samaritan woman, but I did say that I will speak more about it in depth today because there's so much to, to say about um, this conversation and this encounter with Christ and the, and the Samaritan woman. And there's so much that Christ says. There's a lot of symbolism as well, but also who this person was who the Samaritan woman was. Now, the conversation can be found in the Gospel of John, chapter 4. We have the encounter with Christ and the Samaritan woman. At a place known as Sichar, and there at that place, there was a certain well which was built by the patriarch Jacob the son of Abraham, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the son of Isaac. And he built this well and therefore that well was an important spot. And what were the, what were the who were the Samaritans? Samaritans were considered as heretics by the Jews. They believed in God, so they weren't pagans. Um, they weren't idolaters, uh, but they, they did believe in God. But they only accepted the five first books of the Old Testament. Um, the Pentateuch, which is called. And those books were written by Moses. So those five books in the Old Testament, the first five books of the Old Testament, written by Moses were accepted by 
the Samaritans and but they didn't accept the rest of the the Torah that the Jews had the prophets and all that which we still have today and we still read um, and we know is scripture holy scripture inspired by the Holy Spirit the Samaritans didn't and that's why there was conflict between the Samaritans and the Jews they didn't come across each other or they they avoided each other at all costs there was a hatred between them and a violent hatred a lot of the times uh, to the point where a Jew would not go through that city of the Samaritans usually but if it needed to pass <coughs> they would walk around that city in order to avoid the Samaritans so there wouldn't be a violent conflict um, and hence why Christ it's not just by chance that Christ in one of the parables names the Samaritan as being the good person in the story okay if you all, you all know the parable or you've heard of the good Samaritan right and the reason why <coughs> this would have made an impression on the people at the time was that the two people that walked past the person on the ground who was half dead were meant to be the religious people the Levi you know and the scribe the religious people and they walked past him <coughs> and the only person that helped this person who was half dead on the ground was a Samaritan was an enemy okay and was a stranger but there's more to that anyway for another time and so the Jews avoiding that area and funny enough nothing much has changed over 2000 and so years it's still the same it's still a very a, a, an area of conflict the well still exists there okay um, the difference is that um, the well is occupied by the Greek Orthodox Church okay so there's a church there um, built on top of the place uh, where the well is it still exists <coughs> you go underground if any of you have visited that area so you walk into the church the church of um, dedicated to Saint Fortini which is the Saint Samaritan woman and as you go in in the center of the church there's a staircase where you go down to where the well is the well is still there you can still draw water from that well um, still has fresh water and, and everything but there's still conflict in 1975 the priest that was the guardian of that area whose name was Philumenos was actually hacked to death by Jews who didn't want our presence there he was actually martyred he's a saint of the church now we have his icon there up on the on the balcony Saint Philomenos was a martyr and he was martyred at that well and the priest that succeeded him who's still alive today and still is the guardian of that of that place his name is Father Iustinos <coughs> Father Iustinos still up until this day um, receives death threats um, and people coming to try to um, scare him away at one time um, to the point where they were throwing some sort of what do you call those petrol bombs at the monastery he was saying there was uh, one once when he was talking about the difficulties that he faces there because there are no Christians in that area although there's this massive Orthodox Church probably just as big as this church um, there's this massive Orthodox Church and big um, place of pilgrimage um, there are no Christians in that area and one day he said as they were throwing um, petrol bombs at the church and at the monastery wanting to burn it down um, at one stage he, he surrendered 
himself inside the church, he said, <coughs> he turned to St. Philomenos, whose relics are there, um, his bones uh, are there in, in the church, and said to him, I can't do anything anymore if you want to save, save the church that you built, because um, it was St. Philomenos that built that church. And when he looked out the window and saw the people there throwing the um, petrol bombs at the church, he saw St. Philomenos actually standing there with his cassock opened, stopping them from throwing from the petrol bombs actually hitting, hitting the church. And so the fact that the church is standing there till this day, even though there's so many people um, that don't want the Orthodox or Christian presence there, because it's sacred to the Jews, it's Jacob's well, the patriarch Jacob, it's his well, it's sacred to them and they want it. It's sacred to the Muslims, so they want that site as well. Okay, and there's no Christians in the area, and yet it's in the hands of, of the Christian faith, of the Orthodox faith. Um, that in itself is a big miracle. Um, it's funny because when the church was being built, uh, some of you might remember Yasser Arafat. Yasser Arafat um, said to the priest, now Father Iustinos, said to him, our community our Palestinian community, because it's, that's under Palestinian area there, will donate $2 million to your church so that you can finish building your church and your monastery. And Father Ustino said to him, thank you, but no thank you. Because he knew that if he received the money, then that will automatically give them some sort of rights to the place. So he... He denied it. He declined. So the reason why I got into that is just to tell, <coughs> just to give you understanding that 2,000 years have passed and nothing has changed. It's still a very dangerous area. But, um, and this is, the, this is the reason why Samaritans and Jews would avoid each other and coming in contact with each other. The Gospel speaks about Christ coming in contact with this Samaritan woman. And I'll read it to you before we get into it. It says, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus, um, had, uh, that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sicham, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away, into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. <coughs> Where then do you get the living, that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up in everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. 
in that you spoke truly. In, in that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, "Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. <coughs> Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem, the place where one ought to worship is where to one one ought to worship." Jesus said to her, "Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither." On this mountain, nor in Jerusalem, worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, "I know them, that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all these." Jesus said to her, "I who speak to you am he." And at this point, his disciples came, and they marvelled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, "What do you seek, or why are you talking with her?" The woman then left her water pot. Went her way into the city and said to the men, "Come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ?" Then they went out of the city and came to him. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, "Rabbi, eat." But he said to them, "I have food to eat of which you do not know." Therefore, the disciples said to one another, "Has any one brought him anything to eat?" Jesus said to them, "My food." Is to do the will of Him who sent me, and to finish His work. Do you not say there are still four months, and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true: one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not laboured; others have laboured, and you have entered into their labours. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all things that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed with there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, "Now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world." Now, after two days, he departed from there and went to Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Whatever. So, just to take it again from the beginning, we said we spoke about、um, the Samaritans and why the the Samaritans. Sorry, <laughs> my math is very dry.、Um, what am I? The scene is set around a well. If you notice, over the next three weeks, or last week and next week as well, the scenes are set around water. Last week, or sorry, the Sunday before last, was when we spoke about the man who was a paralytic, right? And there, there was that pool. In Bethsaida,、um, which had that miraculous curing, and so Jesus goes and finds him by that pool, which was stirred by an angel, and whoever went in first,、um, whoever went in first was cured. 
Jesus cures the paralytic there. The Sunday that passed, we had the scene set around the well. Jesus, speaking to the Samaritan woman, identifies himself as the living water. This Sunday, the Sunday of the blind man, is when Christ restores the eyes of a man who was born blind. And according to the fathers of the church, <coughs> not only was this man born blind, he was born without eyes. Blind in Greek um, is, you can say tiflos. If you're blind, you're tiflos. But the fathers don't say that he was tiflos. They say that he was aomatos, which means he had no eyes. He was born without eyes. Hence why Christ does not just touch him and is cured. Christ does something um, different. He spits on the ground. And with the, with the dirt from the ground, he takes his spit and he creates clay. And he takes that clay and he puts it on the eyes. He applies it to the eye sockets of the blind man. And he says to him, go and wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. So again, this um, notion of water. So Christ here is identifying himself or showing himself to be God, the creator, by creating again from the dust of the earth that we created to create the eyes of the blind man. When things are said around a well, Water for us, we know, is baptism because it is life. Hence why all the sacraments, all the sacraments begin for us with baptism because it's our initiation into new life. Life in the sense of spiritual baptism or, or spiritual rebirth. We'll see that in the next chapter, in chapter 5, when Christ is speaking to a Pharisee whose name is Nicodemus. And he says to Nicodemus, unless one is born again, they have no place, <coughs> they can't be saved. And Nicodemus says to him, but I'm an old man, how can I enter into my mother's womb? <coughs> and Jesus says to him, to be born again of water and the Spirit. So these two sacraments, in other words, baptism and chrismation, is for us a rebirth. So that's why the font for us, which is placed in the centre of the church, symbolises the womb of the church. But even biologically, if you looked at how, what, a, what a womb is filled with and what a child is, is in the womb, is... It's filled with water. And so when that child is born from the, the, the womb, from the sac, it's, it lives and it's created in that water that it lives in that, in that sac that's in the womb. For us, our spiritual rebirth begins from the font, from the living water, because we know that water for us is that element which is the source of life. Everything which has life in it needs water and therefore Christ identifies himself as the living fountain as the living water and whoever drinks from him shall never thirst again so physical water for our bodies Christ being the spiritual water for our souls and he clearly says in the scriptures at what time he meets this woman there of Samaria. He says at the sixth hour. Now the sixth hour is 12 o'clock noon. At 12 o'clock noon, um, this woman has gone to get her water. First of all, it tells us something a little bit, something about the woman. That this woman was an outcast. That this woman... Was, does, not, does not associate, it doesn't say yet why, but it, says it does not associate with the other people 
from the area, from the village. And why is that? Because she's going to the well alone, by herself. If you're going to a well, as we know, you go to the well in the morning, and usually with company, with other people. And I said this as well on Sunday. Um, many of you, some of you, maybe, who had grandparents, you know, who, who lived in villages at the time, I may have told you stories, um, will tell you that the first thing that, the, that a woman would do was take her, her jar pot that she had, her clay pot, and with the other women from the village would go early in the morning to get food, uh, to get water that was needed for the day. And so that's what they would do first thing in the morning. This woman went at 12 o'clock noon. First of all, it was the middle of the day, it was in the heat, and she was by herself. And that in itself says that she's an outcast. <coughs> but there's also a deep, deeper significance to this hour of the day, the sixth hour. We know that when Christ has come, came to us, he came for a specific purpose, and that purpose was to redeem us, and basically to reverse the, in, the curse that was given to us when we were expelled from paradise because of our disobedience. We know that Adam and Eve were disobedient, and the first person to sin and to be disobedient against God was a woman, was Eve. She listened to the serpent. She fell into the temptation of wanting to be God herself. So she disobeyed the commandment of God. She took from the fruit that was forbidden to take from. According to the holy tradition of the church and to the, according to the fathers of the church, the hour of the day that that happened was the sixth hour. It was, six, six, uh, it was 12 o'clock noon when that happened. The time when Jesus was crucified was what? At what time was Jesus crucified? The sixth hour. Jesus was crucified at 12 o'clock noon. This woman now goes to the, to the well at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. The evangelist John here specifically mentions the time that Christ met this woman at the sixth hour. So the time now becomes important and becomes a link. It becomes a link to the very beginning of creation where Christ, uh, where, where humanity disobeyed God, the time where disobeyed God, to the time where Christ was crucified for the redemption and for the reverse of the curse of all of humanity. And so the evangelist here, by saying that he meets this woman at the sixth hour at 12 o'clock, means that he has come to change this woman's life. He has come to reverse something which is within her, which we'll find out later. He sees something in her, and therefore he exposes himself to her. So when these little details are written in the Gospels, they're not written just by chance. They're not written as something that's insignificant. All of it has a significance. <coughs> and the fathers of the church have specifically told us um, the reason why and given us the interpretations to all of this. So at the sixth hour, he meets this woman. At 12 o'clock noon, he meets this woman at the well. And Jesus says to her, give me a drink. So he opens up a conversation with her. His disciples have gone away to go and find food. So he's alone. The woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink of me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no, don't know dealings with Samaritans. So this woman isn't being rude to him. She's just surprised by the fact that he's speaking to him and he's saying, basically, she's actually looking out for him. Why are you a Jew asking from me, a Samaritan, something to drink? Aren't you afraid? Aren't you afraid for your own safety? She's actually looking out for him. Jesus says to her, 
if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, sir you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? So immediately this woman starts to take Jesus very seriously but at the same time questions him. She doesn't dismiss him but he under she starts to feel and understand something happening and therefore says to him, but you've got nothing to draw with, first of all. Second of all, are you greater than our father um, Jacob? So Jacob was an honored person, okay? He was one of the patriarchs. He was considered as holy. And the Samaritan woman now is saying to him, how are you going to give me this water if you've got nothing to draw with? But does, that, does this make you in some way holier than what our father Jacob was? So she begins to question and she has good intentions by questioning. And this is why Christ <coughs> continues the conversation with her. Usually Christ, when he sees that someone is being deceptive usually shuts them down with an answer and he's very good at that and we see that in the gospels he shuts them down straight away but when he sees that someone has good intentions he continues the dialogue but to bring something out from that person which is hidden within them he sees something in this samaritan woman that's hidden within her and he's trying to bring it out from her so he continues the conversation and says to her, whoever drinks from this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up in everlasting life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may thirst, may not thirst, nor come here to draw. So she doesn't dismiss Christ. She doesn't think that he's crazy, but straight away receives his word and believes him and says to him, give me some of this water. Jesus says to her, I will give you water so that you may never thirst again. And if I was to say to any of you right now, I've got this special water in this bottle. If I give you this and you drink it, you will never thirst again. And you will say to me, thank you very much. Have you taken your medications today? <laughs> it's him. That's what you'll say to me. Um, whereas the Samaritan woman says to him, not in a sarcastic way, not in a dismissive way, but in a way full of faith, give me some of this water so that I might not uh, thirst again. So she perceives that there's something with him which is holy. And so Christ now continues. There, here, we see the difference between this woman who's a Samaritan, who's a heretic, okay, who's not of, let's say, the true faith, because Christ says it to her as well, later on in the conversation, he will say to her that salvation is of the Jews, and yet she fully believes him, and she fully receives his word. Two chapters down, in chapter 6, we have a different conversation, very similar, but it goes in a very different direction. And that's when Christ is talking amongst the Jews and preaching to his so-called followers. Not the twelve, but other people who had followed him. And um, 
this is where Christ says to, says to them, this is in chapter 6 now, Christ says to him, <clears throat> to them, <clears throat> He who eats my flesh, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is, fo is food indeed and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Okay, so this is another conversation now that he's having with Jews. With the Samaritan woman, he calls himself the water of life. With the Jews, he now calls himself the bread of life. But we see now how things are different. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. So very similar words to what he says to the Samaritan woman, again speaking about the Father, again speaking about the Spirit. And and again speaking about life. Um, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and would betray him. And he said, therefore I have, come, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. So they left him. And then Jesus turns to the twelve and says to them, Do you also want to go away? So Jesus gives people absolute freedom. Doesn't, forces any, doesn't force anyone to do anything. He says to the twelve, Do you want to go as well? And then Peter responds and says to him, where are we to go? You have the words of life. So Christ is the living word. So similar conversation, one with a Samaritan woman, another with Jews who were supposedly followers of Christ. This woman believed um, and Christ revealed his mysteries to her. They didn't believe. They were scandalized. They left and therefore understood nothing. And so, um, Christ says to her that you will never thirst again, speaking about baptism. Once we are baptized, then we have with us the living water. St. John Chrysostom says that when Christ is saying that you will never thirst again, then you have everything basically which is sufficient for you. You are baptized, you don't need to be baptized again. It doesn't need to happen again. Once you're baptized, you have everything that you need from the baptism that you have. You have all the nurturing that you need that the church will provide for you through the initiation into the church, which is our mother, from holy baptism. That's what he means when he says, you will never thirst again. When you're baptized, then you can receive the Eucharist, then you can be um, um, forgiven of your sins through the sacrament of confession. You can participate fully, be a full participant in the body of Christ. And therefore, that's why, if you remember, when Christ is washing the feet of his disciples, he goes to Peter and at that point, when he goes to Peter to wash Peter's feet, Peter says to him, 
don't, don't you, I'm not going to let you wash my feet. And Jesus says to him, if you don't let me wash your feet, then you have no part in me. Okay. And then Peter gets scared when he says that, when he, when he hears that. And he says, then don't only wash my feet, but my head and my body as well. He says, wash all of me if it means that I'm going to have a part of you. And then Jesus says to him, you, have, you are already clean. He says, he who's been, been cleansed has no need to, be, to wash the, the, any other part of their body except for, for their feet, the dust that falls on their feet. When Christ is saying that, he means, again, speaking about baptism. If you have been baptized, then there's no need again to be baptized. But even though you will, you will sin after baptism as well, you will require to do the things that are required <coughs> for repentance after baptism. But that doesn't mean that you need to be baptized again. Okay, That's basically what he's saying um, to Peter. So, when this woman now says to him, give me some of this water that I might drink and never thirst, Jesus now gets into the deeper things and said, okay, it's time now for me to show her who I am. So he says to her, go and call your husband. And she says to him, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, you are right in saying that you do not have a husband because you have had five husbands and the man that you're living with now is not your husband. Okay? You're living with someone without, outside of wedlock. What's even more amazing about this is that this young woman, or this woman, whatever she was, however old she was, is not, a, is not the slightest bit offended by what Christ says to her. The first thing that she says back to him is, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And she begins to ask him deep questions. Questions that were concerning her about what the proper way it is to worship God. Now, St. Romanos, one of the saints of the church who's written many hymns, tell us what the meaning is or the significance is behind the five husbands. Why is it five husbands and not two or three or four? Why is it five? Five for us these days means is nothing. I mean, Elizabeth Taylor had how many? <laughs> Was it seven, eight or something? Who knows? But we know that, and this is, this is where we start to see why now she's an outcast amongst, uh, amongst her people. Because she was a woman of the flesh. She was a woman that wanted to, to fulfill her desires, her fleshly desires. And so that's why it wasn't enough for her to have one husband, you know, or two or three. She had five and even though she wasn't lawfully, lawfully married, she was living with someone in sin. Say Romanos now gives us a reason as to why there's five. And that's to say that it's the out, outcast of idolatry, of paganism. Paganism, or the, the worship of idols, was based on five passions and that's why we don't um, this is why this is what makes idolatry very different to the Christian faith and we know this even from the gods that our ancient forefathers used to worship the 12 gods all of them were based on passions they had passions and so Sayro Manos de Melodos gives us five things that determine what was used in order to worship idols. The first was impiety. The second was immorality. 
The third was sexual intercourse. The fourth was cruelty. And the fifth was the murder of children. Okay? Children, sac child sacrifices, which we know was very, very common um, in the days of, of paganism. Pagans would sacrifice, offer sacrifices to their gods, and those, and those sacrifices were the, their, their, their own children. And so those five things determined the demons, let's say, the demons of idolatry. And I'll say them again. Impiety, immorality, sexual intercourse, cruelty, and the murder of children. 2023. <laughs> So, these things really don't differ much to the way that our society has learned to live these days and learned to accept. So what's actually happened is that we've done this big reverse and are basically, basically have become pagans, pagans, without using, without worshipping statues. How many laws have passed uh, over the, uh, worldwide in regards to abortions? Making abortions legal, making abortions very easily accessible, making abortion legal up to full term, so you could be nine months pregnant and just because you haven't had the baby, it hasn't come out of your womb, then that gives you a legal right to kill that child. Okay? And so it could be in the womb um, and she could even be in labor and she still has that right to kill her child. How many how much funding has gone into things like Planned Parenthood? How much um, have we seen lately, or where, how do we, when it comes to immorality, bombarded, bombarded with what these days? What's, what, what, is the, what is the thing that we're bombarded with as if it's the most important topic that needs to be addressed for the salvation of, of the universe and for the mental stability of people. Transgenderism, homosexual marriage, okay? And you need to parade this flag and you need to accept this person because they identify themselves as whatever they want to identify themselves on a Tuesday. It's him. And all these things are normal and we must respect it. It's him. And these are not only things that we see outside the church, these are also things that we see within the church. It's him. Because we're starting to hear it. We're starting to hear people saying, on the weekend, a work friend of mine, she was getting married to her wife. And I was invited to the wedding, so I went. You know? And I said to them, hold on a second. Why did you go? Because I, I was embarrassed to say no. What would they think of me? You know? If I said no, how was, how was I going to face them at work? Yeah. and we're getting these things now and so then are we not also responsible are we not also participating you know in that impiety um, eh, don't even need don't even need to go further into sexual intercourse okay because as you know it's 
the only thing that sells these days? Your flesh, your body. We're advertising toothpaste, so we need to put a naked woman next to it, next to it, to make it more appealing. It's him. And obviously, our children are exposed to this. So, we're not living any different to what they were living then. And the, the concern is not the impiety outside the church. It's, what's, it's what us as Christians, how we're facing it. Because impiety can also be other things. Impiety can also be what? Our laziness. Our being consumed. It's him. And don't tell me now that we every morning get up and do our prayers and in the evening make sure we offer something to God before we go to sleep and that on Sunday mornings we get up to go to church and we thirst to receive from the Eucharist I'm guilty and I know that a lot of you are guilty as well because at night time we lay down on the couch and we flick through our phones and we watch a video on Facebook and after that video there's another video and after that video there's another video and then two, three hours have passed because you've said to yourself I'm going to rest and then you go to sleep okay and you've basically in Greek there's a nice Greek word that I don't know if you can translate it for me, that'll be great. Echume apovlakothi. Okay? How would you say that in English? We've been stupefied. That's, and that's what the, And this is what they want. This is exactly what they want. They want us to be stupid. Tell us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I said the I said the government. Don't worry about the government. They. They're already they're already stupid. That's why they. they of course, the devil, but the devil. But like someone was saying to me before, <coughs> when they were asking, you know, when they were asking me, uh, if I'm saying it correctly, good things come from God, right? Bad things come from the devil. him. Do they always come from the devil? Eh, the devil puts it out there for us. It's up to us whether we're going to take the bait or not, right? But we're stupid because we take the bait. We let ourselves do it. And we say to ourselves, tomorrow will be different. And then the next day we say to ourselves, tomorrow will be different. Eh. And the next thing you know, you're in your coffin, you know, waiting for tomorrow to come for it to be different. Is that not an act of impiety? Are we not being um, impious towards, towards ourselves first and foremost? God, yes, of course. But God is patient with us. God is merciful. God is forgiving. All right, he's all these things. But he sits there and he says to us, he says to us basically, what can I do? What can I do to help you? It's like we go to the doctor and the doctor said to us, you've got cholesterol and you've got diabetes. You need to cut down on these things. 
you know, and not eat these things, you know, and look after yourself, you know, so you can give yourself quality life, not just life, quality life. And we go back to the doctor and, said, and say to the doctor, you know, I'm still drinking a liter of Coke a day, my lunch breaks, I'm stopping by McDonald's and whatever. The doctor's going to say to you, hey, what am I going to do for you, for you? What can I do for you? You're destroying yourself. And so one day when we find ourselves in hell, okay, because that's where we're going, okay, when we find ourselves in hell, we can't turn around and say to God, why did you send me to hell? God's going to say to you, I didn't send you to hell. You sent yourself there. I told you what to do. I told you how to be healed. It was your choice to go there. Not me, not because I wanted to, not because I want to punish you, not because I've got a grudge against you. You ended up there yourself. Okay. And so this is where we need to stop putting the blame on others and start taking responsibility. We need to stop putting the blame on the devil the devil has his job to do, and he does it quite well. Okay, we need to put stop putting the blame on the governments. Okay, we need to stop putting the blame on the LGBTQRZ community. Okay, we need to stop putting the blame on Planned Parenthood, you know, for abortions, etc. Okay, and start taking responsibilities. Okay, and this is what happens. Today, this is what the Samaritan woman does. She takes responsibility. Christ says to her, you're a harlot. Okay. You've had five husbands and, the, and the, the person that you're living with isn't your husband. And she doesn't turn around and say to him, how dare you? You don't know me. You can't judge me. Okay. Or she doesn't try to excuse and say, I had to because of this. She says, I perceive that you are a prophet. Okay. Where should I worship God? You Jews say in Jerusalem, we say on this mountain. How do we worship God? And, God, and Christ starts to say to her, the way that you worship God, the time will come, he says, and now is. In other words, the time now has come. The time is coming, he says, and now is where you will neither worship God on this mountain or over there. He tells her that salvation is of the Jews, that the Jews have the scriptures as they should. Okay. But he says you will worship God in spirit and in truth. That God will be worshipped everywhere and anywhere. You don't need to go to places. You don't need to go... Um, to sacrifice your animals that you do there in the temple of Jerusalem. And now someone's going to get smart with me and say, then why do I need to come to church to worship God? Okay? You don't need to come to church to worship God. Okay? That's a fact. You don't. Okay? But you come to church to be part of the body of Christ. Because that's the only way that it can be done. Because we're not on this journey alone. We're on this journey together towards salvation. No one wants to be saved alone. No one should want to be saved alone. And if they do, then they haven't comprehended who Christ is. And the only way that it can be done is through the Eucharist. And you can't do that at home. You can't do that by yourself. Okay? You can't do that through a TV screen, watching live liturgy, on YouTube. It's him. Um, and so when then Christ basically reveals to her reveals to her the Father, he reveals to her the Spirit, and then she gets a little bit confused and says to him, I know that the Messiah will come, and then when the Messiah comes, he will explain all these things to me, to us. To me, to us. And Jesus says to her, he reveals himself 
to a Samaritan woman before he reveals himself to any other person. I who speak to you am he. And when Christ says this, it says in the scriptures that she leaves her water jar and she runs to the village to tell the villagers that she's met Christ. Now, this specific detail, she leaves her water jar, goes back to fulfill the words of Christ that I am the living water. Whoever drinks from the water that I give you will never thirst again. So she doesn't need her jar anymore. She leaves. She's been filled. Her thirst has been quenched. And she goes and she tells the, the people and then they believe. They go to Christ. Christ stays with them two days. And um, they believe in Christ. Now this woman, for those of you who don't know, is Saint Fortinish. Her name was... Um, her name was, she was baptized for Dinin, for Fos, the light. She's known as equal to the apostles. She had five sisters. She converted all of them. She had two sons. She converted her two sons. They became Christians. All of them, um, all of them were, one of her sister's names, by the way, was Paraskevin. Her two sons were in the army, converted, became Christians. They were all martyred. I think three of them were beheaded. Saint Fortini was thrown in a well. Um, a sister of hers, because she didn't want them to be seen, um, Foto, her, her sister Foto, didn't want, her, want them um, to see her naked, didn't allow them to whip her. So she took the whip off them and basically whipped herself to death. And another sister of hers, they bent two trees, tied her in between, and let the trees go until she was um, cut in pieces. They had a martyr's death, all of them. But they received the crown of martyrdom and, and holiness. It's him. Um, I don't know if you want me to... Eh. Ah. One more thing. It happened at a well. Etsy. Christ says to her, go bring your husbands. But she doesn't bring her husbands. Another interesting fact. The fact that Jesus met her at the well means that it's also something very intimate. When Moses met his wife, Zephora, it was at a well. When um, Jacob met his wife, Rachel, it was at a well. And now Christ meets the Samaritan woman at the well to say, now, I know all your life you've tried to fulfill yourself with the pleasures of your flesh. Because, as we know now, it wasn't that you were trying to fulfill your, your flesh. It was that you were searching for something deeper. And we know this because of the questions that she started to ask and the responses that she received. So you were looking some, something deeper. There was an emptiness in you. And you were searching to fill that emptiness. And you were filling them with men because you didn't know how else to fill them. By Christ now meeting her at the well says, I now am your bridegroom. That's it. You will be filled by me. Uh. So because Saint Fortini wasn't um, had an open heart, and so this is why we should always have our heart open and not to pretend like we know everything. Christ will teach us everything that we need to know and everything that we need to understand. He wasn't so open with everyone. In John chapter 10, he doesn't tell them. He doesn't tell the, um, the Jews who they are, who, who he is. 
the Jews ask him and, sell, t- and, say to, and they say to him, tell us. <coughs> he goes, just say it plainly. Are you the Christ or are you not? To the Samaritan woman, he says, he who speaks to you am he, I am he. But to them, he says, he says to them, you've seen the miracles, you've heard the preaching, nothing that I've done has been in secret. You've seen it all. You make up your own mind. You decide. Okay? If that isn't evidence enough for you after all these miracles and the preaching, if that's not evidence that I am the Christ, then I don't know what else I need to do to show you that I'm the Christ, the Savior. Any questions? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So with the Samaritan woman, there's um, the, are you knowing that our father is Jacob? Hmm. Is Jacob Palestinian or Jewish? Or Samaritan? Uh, yeah. Jacob was, uh, J- Jacob was Hebrew. Like he was. He was, um, he was a Jew. As, as far as, as whatever Judaism was at that time. Not in the form that Judaism was at the time of Christ. Okay, but we know that from Abraham, you know, the law had started to be given. So would they call themselves Jews then? I don't think they called themselves Jews until after Moses. Um, <coughs> yeah. But um, that's, why, that's why he was accepted by the Jews, but also by the Samaritans as well, even though the Samaritans weren't Jews. Because they did um, accept those, as I said, five first books of the Old Testament, which Jacob is in, mentioned in. Yeah. Any other questions? Panayoti, just speak loud yet to then go. Yeah. There's no requirement of baptism um, in, in a sense for, for a Jew. There are other initi- initiations into the faith, but not baptism. Um, baptism started, I, I don't know when it started. It was definitely practiced by St. John the Forerunner again as a, as a type of cleansing, okay? Um, I don't know if it was practiced by others, but we know that St. John the Forerunner did practice baptism and, and the Jews went to him to be baptized. And also the, the disciples of Jesus also practiced baptism and would baptize others, um, uh, Jews as well. But um, it wasn't a requirement according to um, Jewish law, it was more of a purification. Um, And so, and when the disciples were baptizing, which was mentioned in in the Gospels, again, it wasn't the baptism that people received after Pentecost. Again, that was, that, that was different. Yeah. Ne Margarita. Just a little bit louder yet the Yeah. Yeah. 
یہ Definitely, absolutely. She, uh, Christ would not have had this conversation with her if, there, if she was not humble. He wouldn't have been able to open up to her like this without humility. That's what he saw in her. Yeah, and it was because of her humility that she was also searching as well. Yeah. <coughs> Come and see a man who told me all, all, all things that I did in my life. Yeah. Wow. Nick, Christopher. If I had this in Aksari for the February. Because her feast day is in February, maybe it might mention it. Allah, then I'm not exactly sure if it says something here. I don't exactly know when she was martyred. Uh, it would have been definitely after, um, after Christ um, and after Pentecost, sometime when the church would have been established. Yeah. Home time. Bum speed. Christ is risen from the dead. By death he has trampled upon death and to the He's bestowing life. Christ is risen. Have a good night, everyone. God bless.